Purbrahma Gurur Vishnu Gurur Devo Maheshwaraha Gurur Eva Param Brahma Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Chinmayam Yapiat Sarvam Trilogyam Sacharacharam Tatpadam darshitam yena Asmai Sri Gurave Namaha Tvameva Mata Chapita Tvameva Tvameva Bandhu Shasaka Tvameva Tvameva Vedyadravitam Tvameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Tvameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahabiryam Karabhavahai Tejasvinavadhi Tamastuma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 So we are in chapter 6. What verse are we on? We're on verse 30. Verse thirty. Can you help us out, please, Yeah. Yo mam pashyati sarvatra sarvam cha mai He who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me. He never gets separated from me, nor do I get separated from him. So here we're talking about the distinction between the dualists and the non-dualists. So the dualists posit that I have a relationship with God. I have a relationship with Lord Krishna. And I want to get close to him. I want to feel his presence, etc. And what Krishna is implying here is actually you are never separated from God. We have that great Upadesha Mahavakya from the Upanishads, Tatomasi, that thou art. You are God, you are that. Sounds silly. I have a hard time paying my bills. You should see my desk. Sometimes I say unkind things. I get my feelings hurt. How can a little me be God? And what the scriptures say is we have to use the method of lakshanam, of inference, to find the implied meaning. So we have tat, the infinite. We have plum, you, the finite. So we have to remove from our attention all that appears to be impermanent, transient, mutable, changeable. So I have a physical body. My physical body isn't Objective cognition. I know the body. 
If I have an ache or a pain, I know it. If I put on weight, I know it. If I look at a photo of myself when I was uh, 20 years ago, I know the change in my body. I am not the body. I am the knower of the body. The body is impermanent. It is mutable. It is changeable. It is not me. Macrocosm. God has a body. It's not like the marble statue of Lord Shiva or like the flute player Krishna. The body of God is the phenomenal universe called the Jagat. It's called the Jagat because it goes Jagat, 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 Jagat. It too is always changing. Technology used to call it the Einsteinian world of flux. And it is always mutable. It's like you and I have what we call a subtle body, a world of thoughts and feelings, memories, images, stories. But whatever the thoughts and feelings, memories, images, and stories are, I know them. They are transient. They are immutable. And most importantly, they are objects of cognition. The infinite has a subtle body. It's called the total mind. The technical word, kind of a funny one, Hiranya Dharva which literally means golden egg. But it's the sum total of all the thoughts and feelings that have ever been thoughted and felt, that ever can be thoughted and felt. It's what psychics tune into. It's the mind of God. Some people, for example, will go there kind of meditation is to go in meditation to receive wisdom. Where does that wisdom come from? From the mind of God. But the thoughts are impermanent. They're mutable. They're changeable. That's not what we're going to pay attention to. Nephi, nephi. Not this. No. You and I have a causal body caught in the sharia. It is my particular bundle of vasanas, deep psychological impressions that cause me to get agitated, that impel my mind into desire, that impel my body into action. The infinite has a causal body. It's called Ishwara. What does Ishwara literally mean? You can tell me. Usually translated as the Lord. It comes from the root itch, itchity. He who wishes, he who wills, he who intends. The cause of evil. Creator, Yeshua. Now, at the core of your being and my being, if we look at the space between the thoughts into that silence and then introvert the attentive faculty, notice, oh, um, who am I? There's just witnessing consciousness. Ah, the 
pure self. And that consciousness, which is the ground of being of the whole creation, we call it Brahman. I am Atma Brahman. That self in you, me, and everyone. Here then Krishna implies, well, what about this phenomenal world? Scriptures give us two apparently contradictory statements. Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya. Brahman alone is real. Consciousness alone is real. Phenomenal world, Mitya, illusory. Literally a lie. Fake news. What does it mean? The world of name and form comes about as imagination, as sankalpa. It's not solid, separate, and created and apart from. And then Chandogya says, Saravam Kalvidam Brahma, this is verily Brahman. It appears as a world of name and form, but what it really is is consciousness appearing as name. So the yogi realizes their own self as that ground of being, that chiddakasha, that space of pure awareness. Knowing that it is the self in everything. When you realize the self in you, you realize the self in everyone and everything. And then you also see Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma, all this world of name and form. It's just the play of consciousness. Vibration held together by thought. It's all it is. So the mark of the person of steady wisdom. They know their own self is Brahman. They see the self in and through all the objects of the world. Any thoughts on this? Next verse. Sarva Bhuta Stitam Yomam. Ajatye katva masita Sarvatha vartaman upi Sayogi mai vartate. He who, being established in unity, worships me, dwelling in all beings, that yogi abides in me, whatever be his mode of living. Yes. So let's examine the word yoga. Yoga comes from the root yuj, which means to join. What is it that gets joined to what? Some people think I, the miserable creature, the jiva, I'm going to get joined to Brahman. The drop's going to fall into the ocean. Or if you're a dualist, I'm going to get really close. You are that. That one is seen. So what gets joined to what? It is the mind. 
that gets yoked to the self. Right now, because my mind is in the state of ignorance, I do not know, I do not have the direct experience that my nature is Satchidananda, pure existence, pure consciousness, at the fountainhead, the source of all good. Now, it's the nature of the mind to seek the good. That's its karma. Wake up in the morning, and all day long until your head hits the pillow at night. The only thing we do is seek the good by our highest understanding of it and avoid misery. Can you find any other activity in which you engage? Even if you do self-sacrifice, why do you do it? Or some greater good. It's always what we do. The only doubt is where is the good? <clears throat> the person in ignorance thinks people, places, things, and conditions inherently are joy giving or misery producing. But if you examine that passionately, not everybody gets joy from the same things. Not everybody is miserable for the same things. Yet, I get what I want. I'm happy. So where is the locus? of happiness. There it is. So the little Tibetan prayer stone. We'll let it be the stand-in for the widget. Whatever I think is going to bring me happiness. Relationship, a better job, more money, a bigger house, different politics, Weather, gain 10 pounds, lose 10 pounds, whatever it is. So I determine what is dear to me, Priya. Differs from person to person. Then what do I do about it? I attempt to get proximate to my object of desire, my person, place, thing, or situation. That's technical term is moda. I earn it. I date it. I work hard for it. I build it. I invest for it. All sorts of different ways. Get on a plane and go visit it. And at auspicious moments, I'm waiting for these motorcycles to go by. The desire and object of desire become one. The point of pleasure, technical term is Gramona. I think, oh, such luck. I'm such a good worker. Not what I wanted. But what's really happened is momentarily the mind has been freed from its longing. It's the shape of Shakti, it's projecting power. And has come home. But in my ignorance, I call that state the Ananda Mayakusha, the sheep. I do not know what's really happened. I think it's in the object. I do not 
know that I've just used the object that it tastes of my own sandwich. So what the yogi works on first, watch your mind. Make friends with your suffering. What's it feel like to want stuff you don't have? It hurts. Yoga says there's no other suffering. Raga, I attach with four things. Vesha, want to get rid of stuff. Don't believe me. Look to your life. So, when I'm moving through the world, we watch our mind, we watch our mind, we watch our mind. When I'm upset, remember it's a spiritual axiom that if I'm disturbed, no matter the cause, I'm the one with the klesha, the affliction. I'm the one with the attachment. I'm the one with the control issue. I'm the one with the identification. I'm the one caught up in raga and Vesha. Shankar would say, at least don't embrace a rotting corpse thinking it's a beautiful bride. At least know why you're miserable. You're stuck wanting. Um, Spriha, longing. Krishna, thirsting. Vaincha, wanting. And it hurts. The more I want it, and the further away I think the object is, the more suffering I have. fellow hitting himself with a hammer on the head. Sir, why are you doing that? Oh, because it feels so good when I stop. We would think that's crazy. I want this. I want that. I want this person. I want that person. They're not doing it right. Control. More, better, different. More, better, different. Aha! Oh my God, what happened? Another desire comes in. Crazy. That's what we do. Then the other assignment. Pay attention to your experience of pleasure. Yoga says. Pleasure always tastes the same. It will vary in intensity. And it will vary in duration. Depending on how. Thoroughly, the object has satisfied my desire. I get confused because of the diversity of sensory experience. I'm focused on the taste of the chocolate. I'm focused on the beautiful music. I'm focused on the attention and praise. What I'm not paying attention to is what's going on with my mind. Oh, it feels good. That's a kiss of the bliss of Brahma. Own your own honor. There is no more fruitful meditation than those two practices. Such is the power of Maya. I go unconscious. I'm so unhappy. Why? I don't have fill in the blank. If I only had fill in the blank, that's why I'm unhappy. I'm not getting what I want. And then we dress it up. I love this one. I'm not getting my needs met. Psychologists tell us that one. I didn't get a manicure this year, this month. I'm 
not getting my needs met. You have food, clothing, and shelter. Those are your needs. Everything else is a form of desire. Don't dress it up. Now, we don't turn desire off like a light switch. Or we're only that easy. We're able to let go of our attachment to the world through insight. Vipassana, deep inside. I can finally figure out what's going on. Then I develop the desire to be free from desire. I develop the desire to let go of the habituated self. So the yogi, of course, she enjoys the world. Desire arises, no attachment. If a widget comes to her, groovy. Desire, not the desire, become one. Oh, that stopped my mind, Krishna. And you don't give away psychologically your own ananda. That helps you let go of the object. Because it will go. They all do. But the yogi also begins to cultivate. Deep meditative experience. We were talking about Swamiji before class, how empty he was, how deeply his mind abided in the cell. Scriptures say, drown the mind. Good thing about that is it's always available, it's free, it's infinite. There's no end to how deeply the mind can revel in Brahman. Won't rot your liver, and you don't have to look your best. And then the world, the joys of the world, it's like a thimble full of water added to the ocean. Nothing compared to the bliss of the mind yoked to the sun. With that special skill, then the woman or man of knowledge can move through the world and they're no longer shaken by the ups and downs of the world. No longer has the power. To destroy them. So this state has many names, Atmaramana, reveling in the self, Ramananda, rasa, the juice, taste of the bliss of Brahman. Here, Krishna calls it the highest form of worship.
what is the best way to worship Krishna? Not with flowers and ornaments. Love the self. Soak the mind in the sun. Now, if you can't do that yet, blame. It will come. And worship the Lord with a form. Perfectly like that. Any thoughts on this? Next verse. Atmo pam yena sarvatra samam pashyati yojuna sukham vayadi vadukham sayogi paramomataha He who, through the likeness of the self, O Arjuna, sees equality everywhere, be it pleasure or pain, he is regarded as the highest yogi. So this sama drishta, this equality of vision, when my happiness is no longer invested into the names and forms, so it can be a conducive or non-conducive environment, Yogi is steeper, Radha, steady in her wisdom. Stock market goes up, no big deal. Stock market goes down, no big deal. Your political candidate wins, no big deal. Your political candidate doesn't win, no big deal. Don't sweat the small stuff. It's all small stuff. No attachment to the outcome of it. And this is what the Master Jesus meant when he said, my kingdom is not of this world. I am in the world, but not of it. And in the second chapter, Krishna has said, for the yogi, steady wisdom, but his day to the world is night to him. No longer any attachment to the ups and downs of the world. But what is day to him? Satmaramana. The world doesn't even know about. Night to them. She has a different playground. Any thoughts on this? A question. Please. Um, so, the examples that you've given were about the things that happen to a person himself, but what if um, it's the joy and pain? That can happen to one's child. So I have news for you. Children have joys and pains. And sometimes they even precede us in death. But the self of your child is never. Exactly what I said. Physical pain gets as far as the body. Emotional upset gets as far as the mind. But nothing touches the core of our being. Now, if you are identified with your own body, then you're going to see a child as having the body. And what do we do? 
But, you know, we have this, this incredibly challenging teaching when we go back to the second chapter. There's all that preparatory stuff where Arjuna's getting confused about the war. Should I fight it? Should I not fight? Finally, he surrenders. And what does Krishna say in the 11th verse? That's the first of the real teachings. He says to Arjuna, you grieve for whom you should not grieve. Though you speak words of wisdom at the worldly level of Yavahara, what you said is true. But the wise grieve neither for the living nor the dead. That's what it says. The whole rest of the Gita is to explain that one verse. Is that helpful? The first part of it where you said, what you say? Um, sorry, I forgot, but the first part of what you said was pretty helpful. So the child has a son. Yeah. That, and, um, therefore, is also not yeah. So, uh, so you think of pain and pleasure for yourself, uh, of it being true, but it is not true. In the same fashion, the pain and the joy for a child are also not true. Well, each one of us has to work out this teaching in the scripture for ourselves. Maybe what Krishna is saying isn't real. Maybe it's not true. All I can say is, this is what the scripture says. So far, it's proven true for me. And all I can share with you, my own experience. I'm an old man, I'm 75. And even though I'm single, I've had many people who have been dear to me. And I went through the AIDS crisis here in San Francisco during the AIDS. I quit counting after I had lost over 200 friends. I've been at many, many deathbeds. Death is a good friend to me. And I know from my own direct experience that death is not a tragedy. People suffer getting there. Being dead doesn't hurt. Someone dies and I'm grieving. I'm the one who's experiencing the loss. It's my selfishness. Call for what it is. That person's gone on. They're fine. But some of us think the depth of my suffering is a proof of my love. I lose for love does not hurt. Attachment hurts. And sometimes we have attachment. We dress it up with words of love. But if, if this is a hard teaching, you grieve for whom you should not grieve. Though you speak words of wisdom, a wise person does not grieve for the living or the dead. Go back and study chapter two, which gives the foundational material on this. I'm, I'm not saying that it's wrong or bad to grieve the suffering of a child. 
but I'm saying that its ultimate cause is deep spiritual ignorance. Just put that on the shelf. Have you lost a child recently? No. And that was really profound, what he said. The other thing that every parent experiences, our children come through us, they do not belong to us. And of course we want them to be happy, but too frequently that means I want them to do what I think is best. And our children have their own journeys. They have to go through their own joys and sorrows, learn their own lessons. God knows you and I certainly did. And too frequently, parents will see their children as extensions of their egos. Oh, my child isn't a doctor. You know, they were so, had so much potential. Why do I want them to be a doctor? So I can say to my cousin, my God, this is all That's it. Oh, I'm so worried about my son. He's still not making very much money. I'm so worried about him. Is he happy? Well, he says he is. But well, what are you really saying? Who's going to take care of me when I'm old? All sorts of ego can get wrapped up in those seeing viewpoints where we're not so much caring for our children, we're thinking about ourselves. When a child is sick, we are. But who we are speaks much louder than anything we can say. To be at the bedside of a sick child and to simply to hold sacred space. It's frequently the best. Can't tell you how many deathbeds I've been at. That's my job. to be nearby the meditation samadhi holding Satan's good question all right next verse Rajunavacha Yo Yam Yogas Twaya Prokta Samyena Madhusudana Etasyaham Napashami Chashalatvat Chashalatvat Stiram. This yoga of equanimity taught by the This yoga of equanimity taught by thee, O slayer of Madhu, I see not its enduring continuity because of the restlessness of the mind. So Arjun pushes back and he says, good God talk, dude, but our minds are restless. They reach out for this and that. Even when I've tried to meditate, going on for 20, 30 minutes, I don't think what you're saying is, is achievable. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. Who's had that doubt? Yeah. Isn't it wonderful? You're such a textbook yogi. They wrote a book about you 3,500 years ago. Well, your textbook. <laughs> but actually, that should 
give us great solace. Welcome to the human condition of being a yogi. So let's see what happens. Next verse. Chanchalam hi mana krishna pramati balab vadridam tasyaham nikraham manye vayoriba sudushkaram The mind verily is, O Krishna, restless, turbulent, strong and unyielding. I deem it quite as difficult to control us as the wind. Yes. Oh, yes. It's like trying to stand at the shore and discipline the waves to try to make the wind stop blowing. And here, our poet Vyasa uses a wonderful word, chanchalam. So the root is chalchalati, which is to move. Like, uh, where did Brahmana Maharshi live? Aruna achala, arunachala the dawn that never moves. So there's a duplicated root, chanchalam. And not only is moving, it's really moving. That's my mind. Oh, this yoga business, this meditation, not for me. It seems too hard. like trying to control the wind. Anybody else can identify with Arjun? Let's see what the Blessed Lord says. Shri Bhagwan Vacha Asam Shayam Mahabaho Mano Dur Dunir Graham Chalam Abhyasena Tukaunteya the Blessed Lord said, Undoubtedly, O mighty armed one, the mind is difficult to control and is restless. But by practice, O son of Kunti, and by dispassion, it is restrained. So, I'm always reminded of the person who says, Oh, I've been texting or... or instant messaging with this person and we're going to meet up for a date this Friday for the first time. And I need to lose 30 pounds by Friday. <laughs> Anybody ever had thoughts like that? <laughs> that going to happen? But can you lose 30 pounds? But it takes work. It takes consistent efforts. And here Krishna gives us the two operative practices. One practice. Two violent Sure dispassion. What holds my agitated mind in place is attachment. Asangraha. No, that's non-attachment. Sangraha. Attachment. Way to quieten the mind is let go, let go. And as we're sitting in meditation, as thoughts arise, we don't suppress them, but we don't get involved with the theme of our thinking. Bring the mind back in the beginning to a single point. Remember we had those two images in the earlier part of the chapter focusing a point on the brow. Later on, he said on the tip of the nose. Those are just allegories. Having a point of meditation. It can be your breath. 
It can be a mantra. If you're meditating with your eyes open, it can simply be a spot on the floor. And don't believe your thoughts. The most powerful of all renunciation is to renounce our belief in the mind itself. We cannot think a real thought. Those thoughts arise. We do this over and over and So you see somebody at the gym and they've got big, huge muscles. Oh, I want to have muscles like that by Friday. How'd you get that way? Practice in renunciation. Learning a new language. Your job is going to send you to Paris in six months. You want to be able to speak French. Everything in life is accomplished by what we call Purusharta and self effort. Yoga is no different. Yes, a lot of it is grace. I love there's a, a wonderful Zen proverb Enlightenment happens by accident. Zen makes you accident prone. Mm -hmm. I was watching a video about an opera singer who all of a sudden got called up at the last minute that they were understudying, had their great big break for their debut Covent Garden. He said, no, it's not just luck. You have to be prepared when opportunity knocks. So what does this mean, practically speaking? Meditate. Meditate every day. Make it a practice. Inspiration will fail us on the spiritual path. Oh, I don't feel like meditating today. No. You do it anyway. And paradoxically, the difficult meditations where my mind seems to be really running around are oftentimes the best because it's all about the unconscious unloading. So you don't want to judge a single period of meditation, particularly. It is what it is. Just do it every day. And then in terms of the world, let go and let God turn it over. Drop the rock. So many ways of saying it. Tejo Mayananda used to say, the foolish person doesn't take life seriously. The intelligent person takes life seriously. The wise person seriously doesn't take life seriously. Let it be. Nothing in life is important enough for you to lose your serenity. Make it your most prized possession. Is it difficult? Yes. For some people, it progresses more quickly than others. But all of us can make progress. 
Any thoughts on this? One of the most important verses of the description. Next verse. Asam yatatmana yogo dushprapa iti nematihi vashatmana tu yatata shakyo vaptu mupayataha. Yoga, I think, is hard to be attained by one of the uncontrolled self, but the self controlled striving can obtain it by proper means. Yes. So some people have a wrong idea of grace. Oh, I'm going to go see a famous guru, and that's going to fix it. Or I'm going to get vibhuti. That's going to fix it. Or I'm going to go on a pilgrimage to such and such a temple. Or bathe in the holy river. But I go back home and I stay enmeshed, entrenched in my old habits of thinking and I call that armchair grace. Doesn't work. If you are touched by grace, it will impel you into action, into self effort. Krishna will say, person raises themselves into the self by themselves. I can not lower themselves. <coughs> when you make a Chudamani, the next text we're taking up, Shankar will say, success in spiritual endeavors is entirely due to the degree of the qualifications of the fit student. Their factors such as time and place, while important, are fundamental and secondary. It's like Guru Shakti. And everything in life that's lasting and of value, we gain through our own self efforts and God's grace. Any thoughts on this? Oh, I want to be a nuclear physicist. Are you taking a physics class? Oh, I don't really want to. I just want to be a nuclear physicist. I'm going to have to. Okay, I'm taking a physics class. Are you doing the homework? No, it's not fun. It's boring. Are you going to work that way? Suit up or show up. Pay your dues. Put in the time. Very key to life. All right, next verse. Are we getting close to the end? Are there like 42, I think? Uh, more than 42. Okay, maybe it's, it's in the 40s someplace. We'll be fine. We yeah, 47. Okay. And we're on what number tonight? 36. Okay. All right, go. Asam Yatatmana Yogo. Did I did I just do this? Oh yeah, I did this. 37. Uh Arjunavacha Ayati Shraddha Yopeto Yoga Charita Manasa Aprapya Yoga Sam Sithim Kamgatim Krishna Gachati. Arjuna said. When a man, though possessed of faith, is unable to control himself and his mind wanders away from yoga, to what end does he, having failed to attain perfection in yoga, uh, to what end does he go, O Krishna? So, very interesting question. I've made all these sacrifices, lived in an ashram, 
I've been given a five syllable unpronounceable name. And I do sadhana. But nothing's happened. And now I'm going to die. Was it always to me? Maybe, you know, I've had faith and I do some meditation and I get this and I read some scripture. I come to class on occasion, but I still have a lot of psychological issues. I still have a lot of worldly desires. What happens when I die? Do I have to come back and start over again? So, what happens when the yogi dies if they do not attain self-realization? Next verse. Kachinu bhaya viprashta aschinna brahmavip brahmavip nashati Apratishto Mahabaho, Vimuro Brahmanapati. Fallen from both, does he not, O oh mighty arm, perish like a rent cloud? Like a rent cloud. Rent cloud, supportless and deluded in the back of Brahman. So, on a worldly level, so you're a hedge fund manager and you're worth $2 billion. And you have a huge mansion in New York and a house in West Palm and another apartment in Paris and you have a jet. Where does it all go when you die? Your greedy children will get it. What if you learn all sorts of things, you become an expert in astronomy? What is that knowledge? You have a jewelry collection. What happened to Liz Taylor's jewels when she died? Auction. Is yoga the same way? They're all just gone. Do we only get one chance for this? It's about many people have. And what happens, ugh, is it worth it? Why don't I just go be an ordinary woke? Spiritual life, not for me. Much too hard. Let's see what the Blessed Lord says. Next verse. Etan me samshayam Krishna Chetur mahasya sheshata Tvadanya samshaya syasya Chetana yukpada this doubt of mine, O Krishna, please dispel completely, because it is not possible for anyone but you to dispel this doubt. Yes. So there's another verse from Arjun here. So he has this terrible doubt. Is it worth it to strive hard on the spiritual path, even if? It feels like self-realization is very, very far away. And he says, Lord, dispel my doubt. You're the only one who can. Let's see what happens now. Sri Bhagwan Vacha Partha Nevehana Mutra Vinashastasya Vidyate Nahi Kalyana Krit Kaschit Durgatim Tata Gachati. The Blessed Lord said, 
O Partha, neither in the world nor in the next world is there destruction for him. None verily who strives to be good, O my son, ever comes to grief. Yes. So in terms of this world, I'll give you one of the basic laws to have good relationships, reasonably good relationships at work, Good friends. Very simple. Don't be a jerk. Try to be good. So if you lead an ethical life, and I'm reading this one book on, on the different aspects of, of what we would call the yamas and niyamas. And that the, the cornerstone of them all is a hinsa. I like that. Non injury. Just don't be a jerk. Other people will do it yourself. So in this world, you strive hard to be a kind, caring person and do service. Frankly, you'll be happier. You'll be happier. And here Krishna is saying, and that's the best preparation for the beyond. Basically, what he's going to say is, you can't take your money with you. You can't take your stock portfolio with you. You can't take your household possessions with you. You can't take your relationships with you. But you do take your yoga with you. Those spiritual sanskars are then lodged in the subtle body. That becomes the impetus for your next lifetime. Let's see what happens. Going on. Prapya punya kritam lokan, nushitva shashwati sama, suchinam shrimatam gehe, yoga prashto bijayate. Having attained to the worlds of righteous, worlds of the righteous, and having dwelt there for everlasting years, he who had fallen from yoga is born again in the house of the pure and the wealthy. So you spend some time in Swarga, heaven realm, and then those spiritual sanskaras in palace, and here he says, into a house of the pure and the wealthy. Why? If we're in survival mode in life, it's very difficult to do yoga. For the starving, God is bread. So all of us have been born into great privilege. You know, we may not be like Warren Buffett, but in terms of the vast majority of the people in the world, we're incredibly privileged. Some of us may have been born into families where we had spiritual sanskaras set up when we were children. Who came from a home where maybe you did puja or chanted Vedas or went to church as children? Any of you do that? Yeah. That sets these spiritual sanskaras on the subtle body. In time, they will mature and tell us into it. May have the gray punya to meet Mahatma in our youth. When Swamiji was a teenager, again, atheist, Marxist, he kind of by accident decided to 
take the train to Arunachal and see who this fellow was. He had the darshan of Rama Maharshi, he was a teenager. He did not understand any of it. But the Shakti part left an impression on his soul. You never know. All right, we'll stop here. What verse are we on for next week? Uh, 42. 42. Om Pur Namada Pur Namidam Pur Nar Pur Namudachate Pur Nasya Pur Namadhaya Pur Nameda Shishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Namaha Hari Om